Good morning, Southside. <clears throat> Special welcome to any visitors who are here with us this morning. We're grateful for you to come worship with this body, and, and we love having brothers and sisters in Christ come join us. I caught a cold, and last uh, Saturday I woke up and there was no voice left at all, and so I gave Brian less than 24 hours notice, and he just jumped on it like a duck on a June bug, and he... Uh, just brought a beautiful sermon. I was able to listen and just so encouraged. So thank you, um, Brian, for that. That was a, a beautiful time. He said he had a short time to put it together, but I, I felt like it was his whole life that I've been watching him grow and labor in those truths. And that was a lifetime of preparation. And so thank you, God, for your love to our body. I remember 25 years ago, uh, Brian showed up at a church that I was a youth pastor and we talked afterwards in my office, and I said, hey, how would you like to plan a church one day together? Just kind of joking. Uh, and it was prophetic. And just a few years later, we were laboring together in, in Southside Bible Church. So it's just a joy to, to be in the trenches fighting for your joy uh, with that dear brother and, and our, our elders. So we are studying through Romans. Uh, oh, one thing I want to ask you to just, I need self-control. This section is taking my heart up, and um, I don't have a voice, and if I overdo it, I'm going to lose it. So just, if you would every once in a while just say, Lord, calm him down. Just, uh, I, I need to, to not ruin my voice for the rest of my life this morning. So we, we're going to look at Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. And we, we, we said Romans 1 through 11 was climbing Mount Everest, and when we got to the top, we just saw from him, through him, and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. That is the only response to the revelation of God in this gospel. And then we say, well, there's a therefore. How do we live our lives? And we've been climbing this, we called it Mount Denali of, of Christian ethic. And we're going through Romans 12 and 13 now. And we're trying to come to this place of what does God want from his children? And <laughs> this is the, the peak. As we, we look out now, it, it's, it's to, to love, to be imitators of God, imitators of Christ. All men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how they'll know you are a follower of Jesus Christ, because that is Jesus Christ. And so this is it. This is what we should be known for as followers of Christ and as a church. So two weeks ago, I, I introduced this passage and that was the whole sermon, and I apologize for it, but I wanted you to, um, I, I'm trying to figure out where that sun's coming from. We'll figure it out eventually. It's, it's in one of those back rooms, if there's a shade to close in the very far back, I would appreciate it. It's blinding me. Um, so two weeks ago, we, we began looking at the whole flow of the Bible to, to get how does this um, new covenant work, and what's left, and what are we under now? And so we're trying to look at these climactic statements of Paul in verses 8 through 10 of Romans where he says the whole law is fulfilled in, in loving your neighbor. It, it's summed up in this. It fulfills the law. And so the, those are major big statements summing up, fulfilling. Follow God's word. Keep traveling and don't miss major things like that. Those are big statements of God telling you where uh, progressive revelation of salvation is moving. <clears throat> and so I found them all, uh, I found that all too often in my own heart uh, and those that I come in contact with is we, we look at the Pharisees and, and we just can say those whitewashed dogs, tombs, you know, it's just, you can just see it so clear in the scriptures. And many times we, we just take better theology and we get all of our lists and all of our rules and, and we take things like church attendance, singing songs, reading our Bible every day, um, sharing sin together, prayer meetings, how to keep your role in your marriage, how to serve at your church. And we can just take all of those things and just put them out there. And this is what the Christian does. And it's almost like a, a Christmas tree with ornaments and, and, and everything is kind of on the outside, uh, glittering. But the, the whole new covenant is, is the inside. And to, to go from the inside to the out. And so what we're looking at is to make sure that we don't just start doing 
Christian things with no heart and miss what God has been after for the new covenant child for all of history. He doesn't want you to just do your external things and say, see, I'm Christian. He wants you to behold Christ and become something, who you are on the inside. So if you just got external religion, I'm, I'm coming this morning. I want you to bless you. <laughs> and I want you to know this, all those things I just read are amazing and right, coming from the right heart. I'm not down on any of those things. Those are right things. But all too often, it replaces love with these things that I do or the rules that we keep. And we miss that love fulfills the whole law. I meet them all the time, the husbands who do everything right and they don't love their wife. <laughs> I, I just, it, we can just get it all down and miss the substance and the essence and the summing up of all things, the law of Christ and what he's after in his children. And so we can't just go through the motions and do Christian things. This gospel is so much bigger than that. So it, it, it's, it is not love springing up in our hearts for the brethren because of the love of Jesus Christ filling our hearts. We, we stop short. And we check Jesus at the door, and we say, Jesus, thank you for your salvation. Now let me go keep my rules. I'll see you in glory. And that is not the new covenant. The whole design of the new covenant is by faith you're joined into a marriage with Jesus Christ. And from that marriage flows all of his, his righteousness, his death on your behalf, his, his power, his sufficiency uh, to bear fruit for God, to blossom up from that relationship and that fruit called love. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So my, my prayer for this body is more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee, and more love to each other. That is the fulfillment of the whole law. And so let's look uh, this morning at this uh, summing up of all things in Romans 13. Um, I'm going to skip some of my other thoughts. Let's just pray. Father, I come before you and I just I pray all this medicine running through my brain, Lord, that you would still help um, clarity of thought. And my, my prayer is that everybody would see Jesus and they would see him in such a way that love comes out of this relationship. Love to those that are easy, love to those who are hard, love to those who hurt us, love to enemies, love to one another. God, I pray, I pray that that is the fruit that you would get from this glorious gospel in each one of our lives. Have your way with us, God. Check hearts. Let everyone be teachable now. Let, them, let the word of God come in. Don't let sin block. Don't let sin be wax in their ears this morning and keep them from hearing the truth. Spirit of God, move and break through everything. You have such a, a buffet for us this morning in the word of God. Feed us. Feed us till we want no more. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, let's take it up. Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Um, verse 8, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And I know some of you are, are like, let's get past this. This is our third week on it. And next week, wait till you see what we got. You're going to say, can we go back to love? Put your seatbelts on next week. You are not going to like what's coming. It's the message for the right people at the right time, the American dream. It, I mean, it's coming. So get up early, get your hearts ready, and you're going to say, can we go back to love? I like that better. <clears throat> so let's look at, so you might know what the will of God is in Romans 12.1. That's this whole section. We're, we're renewing our minds. God, what is it? And it's how you use your gifts in the body. You're renewing the way you think about one another and you bring these gifts because you want to build each other up in Christ. You begin to love without a hypocrisy. The whole world's love is hypocrisy. And you step into this place and it's a love that is genuine and sincere. It's a, it's a love in Romans 13 that comes under the authorities that God establishes till they tell us to go against the will of God. <clears throat> and it's 
How do we fulfill what God wants from us? How do we fulfill his law? Well, he said it's to love. So what does God want from me? This is big. And here's your outline then as we go through this this morning. Paul's going to give us four considerations about our debt of love to one another. So we're to owe nothing to anyone but to love. And the first thing we're going to look at is there's a permanent priority of this debt. It is a priority and it's permanent to love. Secondly, who do we owe this debt to? Who's my neighbor? Thirdly, how did I get into debt? I don't even know some of these people. Like how, how, creditors, you got to go borrow something. So how did I get into debt to, to all these people? And we're going to look at that. And then what's the proper payment of this debt that we own? So let's begin with the first point, the permanent priority of this debt is to owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. The, the literal is owe nothing to no one except love to each other. Uh, it's kind of a little word play. If you go back to verse seven, when we're looking at taxes, it said, render to all what is due. And it was this noun form of the Greek word, ophilos. And it, so it was render whatever you owe to someone tax-wise, pay them. And now in verse eight, it's in the verb form. And so it's owe nothing to anyone. <laughs> Don't owe anything. And so pay your taxes. Anything that you owe, pay. Don't owe any man anything. Discharge your obligations to all men. There, there's, we could spend weeks on this principle of, of debt. It's a great thing for Americans, but I, I don't think that's what Paul's trying to teach in this section, but it's a great principle. So what you owe, Ben, pay. That's for free. But Paul's going to drive home what he's shooting at. We're to pay to all what we owe them. If taxes, taxes, if honor, honor, pay what you owe. Don't let it be said of you that you owe anything except to love one another. This is all that should be on your ledgers. Any accountants in here, debits and credits. The, the only, yeah, the only thing on your ledger is this. This is the only outstanding debt that you should have. One debt we can never get out of. Uh, we can never say, I've done all the loving that I need to. I'm finished. I've come to the end. He says, love never ends. It's the one debt that you will be paying forever. We have a forever IOU to agape love toward one another. We're, we're debtors. So we have this unique debt, this obligation that you must fulfill, and this debt is carried forth, and it's constantly to be paid. It's a present active participle. Be, be paying this debt. Always, it, just again and again and again, you owe this. Yet Paul will show us this morning, I want you to catch this. Have any of you ever had tax debt? Don't raise your hand. But you know what it can feel like, or any kind of debt. And it, it, it doesn't feel good. You don't run around going, I love my debt. Most people are always like, I want to get rid of my debt. It's so burdensome. And so, Paul, why are you throwing burden on our backs this morning that you got to carry around this love debt the rest of your life? It just, that doesn't feel free. But this is the, the one of great freedom is that I love this debt. <laughs> I love it. I love to love one another. It's what Pastor Rutland preached last week. If you love me, keep my commandments. Um, this is the debt that you love. This should not sit on you like a debt of taxes. It should sit on you with the greatest joy is because the way he loved me, I owe you love till I die. It's, his love is infinite and endless, and I, I just get to pay it out till God calls me home. And I just, you've heard these things again and again, and I'm just praying, Spirit of God, let it break in. I want you to see this is, this is the new covenant. This is the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction, what, what, is you, what are you shooting at, Paul, with all this teaching? Is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? To love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said a new commandment I give you that you love one another even as I have loved you. Paul says you can have the, the, the tongues of angels, you can be burned at the stake, you can sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You can do amazing, abundant things 
for, for good. And if you don't have love, he says, it's just nothing. So that's what I was trying to get at this morning. You, you can do all those things that are great, but if they're not motivated by love, he's saying they're nothing. Galatians, for we through the Spirit by faith, believers, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. That's what matters in the new covenant. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Ephesians 5, therefore, in light of this gospel, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. That's everything I've been trying to say. And gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Paul says, I pray that you would be rooted and grounded in love I pray that as a church, you would be truthing in love. I pray that you would consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Peter, be fervent in your love for one another. John says, this is his commandment that you believe in his son and love one another. If you don't have love of the brother, and he says, how can the love of Christ be in you? (laughs) So any true student of the word of God, you just can't miss that this is the, the Denali of Christian ethic. This is what your God wants from you. So get alone with God and do some examination. Do you just spend your whole life looking at yourself? Just be honest before God. Looking at Jesus and love to others springing up in your heart that no law could have ever produced. Is that what's happening? Or are you just the most selfish person on the face of the earth that has right doctrine? It's got to be answered. That's where he's taken this. Go ask an apple, hey, how did you get so ripe and luscious? And the apple's going to say, I just stayed on the vine. I just stayed on the vine. And may we all ripen as we abide in the vine with this luscious love, abundant. And so I got one quick question before I go on. What's the greatest commandment? to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I think Paul forgot that here. He's just, he, he doesn't even talk about that. How, how can you say to love your neighbor is the fulfillment of the whole law? God, Paul, you forgot something big, like loving God with your whole being. And the answer, I think, is simple. This is chapter 13. Paul has spent 11 chapters on the love of God. He unpacked it, and he unpacked that it produces our love to him. (laughs) His love awakens us in a deep, deep love. It says, uh, for he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. God. Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. So I, I, I want you to, to get that Paul is assuming this. You can't love your neighbor ever until you love God first and foremost. This can't come out. It's what Brian preached last week. If, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You, you'll never love others unless you first love him. It can't flow out. Paul's talking to Christians who love God. He began the epistle that way. And when this love spills over, it will spill in love to others. And so I just want to begin with, that's the permanent priority of your debt. You're to owe men nothing except present tense participle to be loving them daily, a debt that will never be finished. We'll get to glory and we'll get to pay it for all of eternity. It's one of the great privileges of the children of God. So my second question, who do we owe this debt to? Who are our creditors? And it's always a good question. Sometimes you give yourself away because I just, could you limit it? You know, I think that guy that came to Jesus and said, who's my neighbor? He was hoping he'd make it small and I can do that. But this is not, the answer is going to be everybody. (laughs) It's the church for sure. It's a one another verse. So 36 of the, the 41 anothering verses are for the bride of Christ, and it's the whole context of Romans 12, which has been the community of believers. And so right away is we owe this to one another in the body of Christ. And so look around. This is what the gospel has done to our hearts. And forget being American, forget being self-contained, self-sustained. We need each other, and we need to love each other. 
That's the fulfillment of the law. Do your creditors know that you love them? Look around. I, I mean it. Look around. Is there a growing number of people that you don't like, that you're bitter at, you're upset with, you, you're not dealing with conflict, you're letting it harbor, your hurts are deeper than your love? It's a bad sign that love covers a multitude of sin. Or is there agape for all, even the ones who have hurt you, even enemy love? This is how all men will know we're his disciples. It's a lot easier to serve and stay away from people and not open up your heart. One of the, one of the best ways to hide from love can be service. Sometimes your love is service. And sometimes we serve so we don't have to love. <laughs> It's way easier to study doctrine and become a theologian than to fulfill the law's demand to love. To get the law's proper place in new covenant history and not love is to miss it. And so I want you to see that in uh, Leviticus 19, 18, it says, love your fellow countrymen, love your own race. Moses said, love the stranger and the alien. And then I think the clearest is when the man walked up to Jesus and said, who is my neighbor? Let me read it. Luke 10, 30. Who's my neighbor? Jesus said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers and they stripped him and they beat him. And they went off leaving him half dead. And by chance, thank you, Lord, a certain priest was going down on that road. But when he saw him, he passed on the other side. They hate Samaritans. And likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, love. And he came to him, and he bandaged up his wounds, and he poured oil and wine on them, and he put them on his beast, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I'll repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. So brothers and sisters, the debt that we owe to love is to all men, not just the easy ones, or we'll be like, just like unbelievers. It's to all men that we owe this debt. So this debt of love is permanent. It's a permanent priority. Um, it's everyone is who we owe it to. And the third question is, what is the, the grounds of this debt? Is how did we get into such a debt? And that question is, is a good one because it, it starts to open up how we can do this. So how did I become indebted to all these people? I, did, I didn't borrow from any of them. And if you'll flip to Romans chapter one, we've looked at this before, but I want to do it one more time. <coughs> Turn to Romans chapter one. I just, this verse just sat on me when we preached it a couple years back. Verse 14, I am under obligation, and that Greek word there is a debtor. So I'm, I'm indebted to, to who? Well, to Greeks and to barbarians, to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm, I'm now indebted to all men, the rich, the poor, civilized, uncivilized. I'm a debtor. I owe them. And the question is, how did you get to be in a debt to these people? And he tells us in Romans 1.5, here's how I got into debt. Through whom? We received grace in this gospel. And we were given apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for all the Gentiles for his name's sake. And so the way I got into this debt was the grace of God. What he has done for me in Jesus Christ. And so grace puts me into debt to all of mankind. That's how I get into debt. It isn't that I borrowed said, I received. 
I received. And, and what it produces in Romans 1.15, so for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. I'm a debtor, and all I want to do then is go to all men to tell them how to be saved. I was saved from the wrath of God, and I can't spend the rest of my life looking at people under his wrath saying, what's for lunch? How's my 401k doing? He's saying, what, what, what happens now is I owe a debt to all of humanity. I received free grace. I was going to kill Christians when God knocked me off my horse. And now I, I'm a debtor to all men. Everybody, rich and poor, to tell them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to care, and I want them to be made right with God, and to be healed, and to be saved, and to know him. I want others to grow in their knowledge of him. I'm a debtor. I, I just owe everybody the gospel and my life, because I received the free grace of God in Jesus Christ. So when I put my faith in Christ and trusted him as my redeemer, he had no debt to me. He had no responsibility to me. He freely took my debt and the soul that sins must die and he died on a cross paying it. He brought me into acceptance and favor with God and has given me every spiritual blessing. My friends, it was at Calvary that I became indebted to all men. The debt to love them and do them good, that's what was put to my ledger. And don't miss this. All that you owed God for your sin was paid in full. You're not paying back grace. Okay? I don't spend the rest of my life trying to pay it back. We call that world's religion. We, we call that legalism. People in the church everywhere are trying to pay back grace. And I'm just going to, I just, oh, I just got to keep paying. I got to keep paying. And you live in guilt every day trying to pay that back. I want you to hear this. Grace is paid in full. It's done. Finished. And the grace, grace pays debts. It doesn't incur them. But God's grace paid my debt and made me free. And now I am free with a debt to go love all of mankind. That's my freedom. I'm going to read Titus 3. Remind them to be subject to the rulers and to authorities. Could sound familiar? To be obedient and to be ready for every good deed. To malign no one. To be uncontentious and gentle. Showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves and disobedient, deceived and enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. He couldn't fulfill the law. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so this is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. That grace causes you to engage in love to others. And so I want you to hear this. Our debt, our debt, and this passage is not what we received from men, but on account of what we have received from God. And we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So Paul is pouring out his heart to us this morning. His love has taken me over. Paul's saying it was undeserved and it was unmerited. And now I serve others the way he loved me. This great love of God cannot stop at me. His love stirs my love to pay a debt to all men, to love. That's the fulfillment of the law. 
This is what God wants from his children. Are you getting it? It breaks my heart when I see Christians who are hard, crusty, always upset, isolating, uncaring, unloving. God wants this gospel to just open that heart up. Christ Jesus is coming to the world to save sinners among who I am foremost. Amen? Let that get the rusty, dry gears moving this morning, the love of Christ. Let it open you up. Don't, don't die crusty, okay? That's for bread, not for humans. Let, let the gospel open you up. So a permanent priority to love all men. Who do we owe this to? Everyone. What is the grounds of this debt, the grace of God who paid my debt. And then fourthly, what's the proper payment of my debt? (coughs) How do I pay it to love my neighbor? And the scriptures give us two ways in in this context. He says to love uh, your neighbor as yourself. And then we saw in John 14 last week, a new commandment I give to you, to love as Christ has loved you. So that is the proper payment. So Romans 13, 9, look at it. For this, you shall not commit adultery. So this is the second tablet. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, I just love that. If there's any other one, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Will will anyone who loves his neighbor um, commit adultery, murder, steal, covet? It's just, it's fulfilled. You, know, you won't do those, you won't do those things, okay? So love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So Paul quotes from the Old Testament, and, and because what we're taught today, I want you to think through this, where we were told that if you don't love yourself enough, you can nev- never love others, so you can't fulfill the law until you love yourself enough. And so we spend all of our lives trying to love ourselves enough and then I can fulfill it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I don't think that's right. If we could just get a better perspective of ourselves, we could love others better. And so there's kind of a movement that started in the 80s, along with a lot of good music. But it, it was this focus on, on loving yourself. It became a big thing in the church. And the fruit is now we're the most narcissistic society in the history of the world. That's what it's produced. But don't miss what this command is. It's not a command to self-love. To be infatuated with ourselves, to make ourselves the center reference point of life, that's not what's going on here. (laughs) Paul says that's what brought the condemnation of God in Romans 1 through 3, is you were self-focused and everything was about self. That's why the wrath of God comes. And I've watched this in my own heart. We think about ourselves way too much. Just way too much. I had this person with a bad self-image, and she just sat all day long, just consumed with how do people think about me? What do they think? What do they, it just, it was this self-consumption, and there's no freedom to be set free to love. I'm telling you this to bless you. Romans 1 through 3, our problem is that we're stuck in self-love. And that's why you can't fulfill the law's demands. We love ourselves, and the, and the law comes and says, love others. And, and what springs up, you can't do it. It can't come from that heart. You can command it till the cows come home, but no one can do it. It's supposed to tutor you to Jesus because you can't love. With those selfish hearts, you can never do it. And there's one who did, and in him there's a greater power than self-love that can spring forth to others, this new self, this new man, the new heart, which is the fulfillment of the law. So I want you to catch this. What is Paul talking about then? What he's saying, we have a natural, instinctive, unconscious devotion to what will bring our comfort and welfare. Every one of us have this. We're we're trying to stay alive. We're trying to eat. We're trying to stay clean. We want shelter. Every one of us are wired to protect ourselves. You know, um, you probably got up and looked in the mirror for a while this morning to get ready. You you, you care about yourself. You care about how how you look and are you fed. And and so you're, you're always thinking about 
making sure you're good. All men have it for sure. God is not disparaging it. I want to hear that. The instinctive devotion to ourselves in, in like manner, uh, we're to be devoted to the welfare and happiness to those around us. The way that you care about yourself so easily, he's saying, care about others that way. Let it, let it come easily. Let it come as natural as you think about yourself. Pretty simple principle that no one can do when you're a slave to sin. That's how it tutors you. And so we're just so energetic about what we need. I have this one person I know that um, just kind of thinks about self all day long. And man, when it's time to, to make lunch, just singing, happy. And it just, it's so easy to, to just always just love taking care of yourself and thinking about yourself. It's so easy. Will you be like this to those around you? Well, you begin to take this principle within you, and I, I, I think it's the principle of image, not, not so much fallen image in this picture, is, and take that to be zealous for others. Make the measure of yourself be the measure of yourself given, giving. This will be the place of freedom. So how could anyone fulfill the law's demand to love your neighbor as yourself? And that's what, I'm, I'm just going to read it to you because I'm running out of time. Romans 8 says this, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, make you a lover, weak as it was to the flesh, God did, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that we could keep the requirement of the law. There's a way now to love. There's a way as you look at the love of Jesus Christ and, and get a new heart in the Holy Spirit and be made new. There is a way now to love Christ and love others. And I'll tell you, it, it won't be perfectly to glory, but something has changed within you. And every believer in this room can testify, I'm not what I should be, could be, or ought to be, but because of Christ, I'm not the same. There's a love springing up as I look at Jesus Christ and behold this gospel that is beginning to come out of me that never came out of me in my natural state. And, and so don't, don't hide from that. That's what God does in hearts. That's what he does in lives. And the other is his love. I, I hate to finish it this way, but as I have loved you, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. He will lay down his life for his sheep, the horrors of the cross. Jesus says, I withhold nothing for the sake of those whom I love. It's, it's the measure of my love. This is how far I'll go. I'll go to Calvary. The law of Christ is to love as he loved us, eternal, unconditional love. It wasn't determined by the worthiness of the object. Uh, we were unworthy. That was my mugshot. And he gave himself for us while we were yet sinners. He saw who we were and it didn't quench his love for us. This, this is so much bigger than the law. It's go like I have loved you. I, 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 your unworthiness and unfitness is what draws out my love and sacrifice and giving and concern. This is a whole nother level. Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus to show us what the love of Christ is. This is the love of Christ. It's purposeful. It's not just moral teachings. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. The purpose for all that he did and said was to save men from their sins. Let nothing in men restrain us from seeking their highest good. He withheld nothing of himself. He emptied himself. He washed feet. This is the debt that we owe to all mankind. And this is how it's to be paid. This is whom it's owed to. We see what men are. We see what they need. And we seek to do them good as Jesus Christ did. So this love is not just self-love only, but saving love. How far will it go? This is our debt when you receive Jesus. We love all. All are our creditors. Owe nothing to anyone except to love. And I'll just tell you, this is for free. What I see in evangelism, I've shown men and women and children that, that they're sinners. And you can use the Ten Commandments, and I've shown them, and they're like, yeah, I guess I've, I've broken a few of those. And, and then I've shown them the greatest love that has ever been known in Jesus Christ and what he has done for them. And that word of love like that and the tears begin to flow every time. 
and they begin to all of a sudden just be broken. That, that is, I'm undone. And yet there's the remedy for how undone I am. Staring into Jesus Christ, who can save them from their sin. I love this gospel. Beautiful. And we're going to close out. I have, I have someone who doesn't like me preaching this long, and I should stop right now because I love them. But I'll tell you this right now. These three point, these points of application are worth it. So we're going to go a little later. I, I, I love um, fellowships because um, you get food afterwards, and I can go just a little bit longer. So just, I promise you, this is, this is good. Wake up. You're going to like this. This is, if you've been bored the whole sermon, here we go. First, if you'll wake up, I want you to be tutored to Jesus Christ this morning. If you've just had an external covering your whole life, it's all you have. Your rules, you're not nice, you're not kind. Go ask your family, they all tell you, you're just not. You're just mean. You're a gnarly dude. And this morning, the gospel just opens you up. You're sitting here going, I, I don't have any love. I got all my rules. I condemn everybody who doesn't agree with me. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about this morning. And Jesus is saying, that's what I came for, was to make you into that kind of man, woman, or child. And he wants you to look at that heart that no rules can change. And you've been in church a long time, and you have no love. No love for Christ. No love for others. And so this morning, he let it tutor you to Jesus Christ who hung on a cross and died in your place. And he's just saying, you can't love that way. Have you died? Have you come to me? I can love that way. I came to this earth and I did love that way. And I will put you in me. And now you'll be treated as if you love the way I lived. And in that, the little seed of love will start bubbling up like a fruit in your life. It won't be something that you got to go work at. It's something that springs up from beholding the gospel of Jesus Christ and all of his beauty. And so I just want to give you the offer of Jesus Christ who said, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden with keeping all your rules and have never found the joy and the peace in Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning was your day that he is calling you to himself to come and find rest for the heart that you cannot change and make love. So I give you the best thing there is, Jesus Christ. Secondly, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to use notes. It'll go quicker. <clears throat> Sanctification. This is easy. This is the law of Christ. So you're to, you're to love Christ, and you're to love, each, you're to love each other. You're to love all men. And I just, I've had the privilege of sitting with some husbands who have lost their wives. And you know what every one of them have said to me? I wish I would have loved her better. I wish I would have loved her better. I don't want to come to my deathbed like that. I don't want to look at the body of Christ and say, I, I wish I'd have loved them better. So it's just, kids, what a privilege to love your siblings. This is your, this is your beautiful calling to love that little one who steals your toy or gets in your way. The gospel can just break out in your home to show agape to one another. I, I pray that all men would know we're your disciples because we have love for one another. We could flesh that out for years. I want you to get along with God and let him flesh that out. Love. And third, I've been going through this book, CTO, Call to Obedience, and I've spent a lot of time in examination of my own heart and thinking through times with you, times in counseling, times in my own family and discipleship. And I just, what is it? What are the things that are keeping us from growing in love? Because I bet everything I just preached, you're like, you are a broken record. I've heard this so many times. And I agree, so have I. Are you growing in it? What are some of the things? I'm going to take a shot at three things. Um, let's see. Some of them, 
I've hit. You could be reversing justification and sanctification. You're trying to change your life enough so you can rest in Christ. Uh, you come back under the law. You don't stand firm in your freedom. There's just something you're not getting in the gospel. But I've spent three years on that subject, so I don't... It could be still on the way, but I don't know if that's it. So I, I used to think, you just, you just don't get love or it springs forth. And it should spring forth, but there are things that we need to renew our minds in to keep growing for love to... You've got to pull weeds. You've got to pull weeds to get more fruit. <laughs> so I want to pull some weeds. All right. Um, one thought. Let's see here. What is, the, what is the root of this? I want to look at, at this heart with love. Tim Keller this week, when he passed away from pancreatic cancer, was a, a brother who, who meant a lot to me. And there was a guy writing a book about him who knew him very well and worked with him. And he said he never heard him speak cross with anyone, probably because he was too busy speaking about the cross, was his conclusion. I've never heard him speak cross about anyone because he was too busy speaking about the cross. That might be all you needed to hear this morning. But I've come across a few more ideas. I'm going to try to hit them real quick. First one is fear. I'm just watching more and more that fear is what keeps us from love sometimes. The fear of the Lord is a gift. It's the beginning of wisdom. It drives out all fears. Isn't that interesting? Perfect love drives out all fears. So this is a, a bad kind of fear, not the good kind, a sinful fear. Fear is the sinful result of choosing not to trust God, not to trust his perfect character or his commands or his promises. The, the Bible, I'm not believing, I'm not trusting in the promises, who he is, what he says <coughs> he will do. There's the gospel. And this guy, Randy Murphy, who is a, one of the writers in this, said, where pride is the result of having too big of a view of yourself, you just think too much of yourself, fear is the result of having too small of a view of God. And the reason we're afraid is because God's too small in our eyes. And that's causing fear. And fear is usually produced by being focused on yourself, your circumstances, or your future instead of God. And those things are producing fear. Fear wants to be in control of your world. And it's interesting that perfect love can drive out all fear. Amen. The fear, I like to love people from a distance. People are scary. They're not safe. I'll just pray for them. I can't risk opening myself up to people like that. I can't handle the pain of rejection and I can't handle the pain of judgment. I'm just going to close up. And I have compassion that you feel that way. But I look at the cross and I look at the fulfillment of the law and what God wants from you and he, that's, not, that's not sufficient. And he wants you to look at this gospel and let it open up your heart and let it begin healing to where I I have to love because he first, it just flows, it's a fruit. I'm more worried about your need than my hurt. That's what the gospel can do. The answer is you can, you have God. And the just shall live by faith. That's where we got to live, guys, to believe all these truths about God and his promises and what he says. This, this writer said, you'll become authentic or real when you have nothing to hide. So be confessing your sins, <clears throat> to fear, to protect, because you trust God to be the source of your emotional and spiritual stability. You quit demanding that others meet your desires and expectations. You quit trying to please others for the purpose of winning their acceptance you're able to love and reach out to others for their sake because you are free in Jesus Christ. There's a way to be free. Release our fears to God. And so I'm a minister for your joy not to hurt you. I want us to start facing our fears, believing the gospel, renewing your mind. Every time I've had a fear this week that came up, I just started renewing my mind, looking at what is it? And what is it I'm not believing about God and the gospel? 
And to not live in these fears, you, you've spent your whole life entrenching in these fears and feeding them. And there's a way to begin to renew your mind to stop living in fear. Perfect love can drive it out. And so his love and this gospel is, he's just ready to start driving out fear. When I trust his character, his plan, his purpose, my future, I don't have to be afraid. I watched, I, mean, I think it was Home Alone with that little guy, Kevin. And, and I remember he was afraid of everything. He felt like me. And at the end, he, finally he's like, I'm not afraid. And he's just, that's how I felt all week. I'm not afraid. Isn't that beautiful? It's what God wants for the children of God. It's not, it shouldn't be something abnormal. He wants us to quit living. I think Americans are the most fearful people because we're always trying to build security and we're always worried about not having enough. And I just want you to get to this place. I don't have to be afraid. I have God. I have God and he's working for my good. And, and, and fear will keep you from loving because you, you don't want to get hurt. You're, you're too worried about your own kingdom. You will not love when you're filled with fear. I'm gonna, I, I should stop, but I'm going to go after a couple others and I'm going to do these really quick. The other he talks about in this book is, is being controllers. And so usually fear will drive you to try to control. And you usually want to try to control people or circumstances. And so when I'm a controller, I'm always trying, and I can be the, you know, you know the jerk who, who's just always controlling and they're just, you can see them a mile away and you're like, that's ridiculous. But you can be a controller by weeping and trying to get your husband to do what you want. You can be a controller by always trying to please people. There, there are a lot of ways to be controllers. And what I want you to see is when you're trying to control your kingdom, you can't love. You, you're just, you're using people, even when you're nice to them. And the gospel comes and says, you can be set free and give everything over to the one who is in control. And now you can love people. And you don't have to control everything because God is. Isn't that better? I've tried to control things and I stink at it. It's great to have a God who always gets it. Right? Do, you, do you want love this morning? Maybe it's because you're just controlling your whole life, your kids, you're choking your kids to death. You're just controlling, controlling, controlling. And I want you to come into the freedom of the children of God this morning. <clears throat> and the last one is real simple, and we'll do it in 30 seconds, emotional pain. <laughs> Everyone has emotional pain. Everyone has circumstances that have caused them emotional pain. And God wants you to face and acknowledge and experience emotional pain as well as use his means to be released from it. So God has decreed your life to have emotional pain as an instrument to make you more like him. And so though, when we begin to open up that he's going to bring that into our lives, but how do I renew my mind and respond right to the emotional pain and how do I get through it? Um, like Paul in Christ, Paul and his thorn in the flesh took that pain and he dealt with it. Christ in Gethsemane, <clears throat> they did it in godly ways. So this, this author says there's two main ways to deal with emotional pain. And I want you to see if you fit them. One, <clears throat> you just suppress it. I don't have any emotional pain. My parents didn't hurt me. I, that, that, that spouse who did that and walked away, I'm not hurt. I'm I'm good. I'm just going to minimize it, deny it, and I'm never going to feel emotional pain. I'm going to turn off my, my emotions, and I'll, I'll never feel it again. And I meet people in this state, and you can't love. You'll never be able to love when you turn off your emotions. And so you're just surviving because your pain you can't deal with. And I've had people where it was so painful at a young age, they, they couldn't. And so now as adults, we got to start dealing with it. We got to start working through not just suppressing it because it will, it will shut your heart off and you won't love. And the other way is to just dwell on it the rest of your life with self-pity and bitterness and fear and self-absorption and depression. And all you do is focus on your emotional pain. And this guy does such a good job of showing 
that God gives you himself and his spirit and his word to guide you from pain to freedom. And he wants to take that pain and he wants to work in your life and grow you and sanctify you and not have you live there. Because when you are focused on it and dwelling on it, guess what? You don't love because you're too focused on your pain and you won't, you won't love others. So you got to heal this. The gospel can heal this. I love this. George Matheson said, the comfort of Christ's revelation is not that it teaches emancipation from sorrow, but emancipation through sorrow. That's how he's going to grow us and sanctify us. And my la- Jesus, I like the way he said it, in this world, you will have tribulation, sorrow, but take heart, I've overcome the world. He says, you're going to have it. So now we got to learn how to view it in light of the gospel. And my last quote, and I'll pray. Sorrow under the power of divine grace performs various ministries in our lives. Sorrow reveals unknown depths of the soul and unknown capacities for suffering and service. Light-hearted, frivolous people are always shallow and are never aware of their own meagerness or lack of depth. Sorrow is God's tool to plow the depths of the soul that it may yield a richer harvest in a fallen world. Sorrow, yet with despair removed, is the power chosen to reveal us to ourselves. Accordingly, it is sorrow that causes us to take the time to think deeply and seriously. Sorrow makes us move more slowly and considerately and examine our motives and our attitudes. It opens within us the capacities of the heavenly life and it makes us willing to set our capacities afloat in a a limitless sea of service for God and for others. I pray that we could be set free from fear, control, and our emotional pain to love others, to fulfill the whole law of what God wants from you. And you have a whole uh, leadership committed in in this, this discipleship ministry that is being put together so that you'll begin to journey these things in truth to become lovers of God and others. So we're, we are committed to help you grow and work through these things. Don't do it alone, okay? Like we're, we're, we're a family. And come out and let's begin growing in our ability to love each other. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Um, I pray that you will use these things in our hearts this morning. God, I pray that our as we look at Jesus Christ and see that that paid a debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. God, and that set us free. That made us free to you, but debtors to love all of mankind. And so God, I pray that we will fulfill the law of Christ to love the way he loved. And I pray it'll come from the freedom of this gospel and some of the things we looked at that block our love or trip it up I pray that you will keep sanctifying us and growing us and making us more like Jesus. Lord, I want to love like Jesus. Thank you for giving us his spirit and his word. Bear that fruit in many, many lives in this place, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.